like Grandma Hilson. I never called her by her first name. That would have been the wrong thing to do. But her name was Elva. Elva Hilson. Couldn't get any more Norwegian than Elva Hilson. And she, as my memory goes, my grandma died in like, oh, what year was it, honey? 1993, maybe? Um, I think she died in 93. But um, when I, growing up, you know, we'd go to grandma and grandpa's for the holidays over the river and through the woods to grandma's house. We would go, literally. And uh, we'd go see grandma and grandpa for, you know, the big holidays and stay overnight and whatnot. And I remember my grandma Hilson being the hostess with the absolute mostess. You know, from my experience, my perspective of things, and I was the youngest grandchild of the youngest child, Grandma never, ever sat down, especially when she came to cooking the Christmas meal. And everybody would be gathered, all their children and all the grandchildren. The table would be packed. She'd get everybody around the table. And I don't remember how many of us there were, but she'd get everybody around the table. And Grandma never, ever sat down from my memory. She was always serving. She wanted to make sure that everybody was eating and had their fill before she ever sat down. And there's times, I don't even know if I remember her ever even sitting at the dining room table, but she would sit at the the little tiny kitchen table that was just where she and grandpa would eat their meals when no one was around. Now, of course, my grandma Elva did sit down from time to time and share the meal with us. But again, it was only after making sure everyone was served. Grandma just wanted to make sure that everyone was taken care of before her. And again, I as I said earlier, just a moment ago, she was the hostess with the absolute mostess. But I think that she also learned at some point in time in life that she needed to take a load off and like just kind of sit, kind of sit a spell, if you will, and take some time for herself, take time for the Lord and for her relationships with her husband and her children and grandchildren. Today, we're going to look at the story of Mary and Martha, right? The two sisters, one who was the hostess with the mostess, and, and the other one, I would say, was more like hopelessly devoted to Jesus. And for you and I, looking at this story to learn about, well, how do we strike a balance, really, between the two while not neglecting that which is most important, right? And to do that, we're going to go back to the gospel that we heard just a few minutes ago, the gospel according to Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. We're going to reread it, uh, mostly for the benefit of our listening audience who will be following along on YouTube here in the next coming few days and, and down at the time. And we hear this. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed her into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. And she came and said to Jesus, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. Come and take a pause. What do we know about Mary? What do we know about Martha? Well, obviously, they're sisters, right? And they are sisters to Lazarus, the very same Lazarus that, that died, whom Jesus raised from the dead where later on in the Gospels we hear the story where the shortest verse, shortest sentence of the whole Bible, Jesus wept, that very same Lazarus. They lived in a town, in a village called Bethany, which was just outside of Jerusalem, just a little bit. Today we would call that like a suburb or a bedroom community. And in a different Gospel account, out of the Gospel according to John, as I was just sharing, we hear that just Six days before Jesus went to the cross, we hear and see in that chapter, John, uh, the chapter 12, verse 2, we, we see Martha serving again, where we hear that she, not only here in this chapter in Luke, is like the hostess with the mostess, right? But you get a backup of that in this other gospel account. We see Mary, excuse me, Martha doing the same exact thing. We hear there in that gospel account, that Martha was serving a meal, a big meal that was prepared in Jesus' honor. That story is really one in itself, really for another day, but really what's important to hear in this story is that Martha's devotion, and I want you to hear this, her devotion to the Lord really centered on serving, to being that hostess with the mostess, if you will. If you think about Martha, her heart was for service. 
And that is a wonderful attribute that none of us should ever, ever downplay. Because hospitality is huge in the Lord's eye. And we see that out of that first lesson that we heard out of Genesis. Where Abraham sees these three strangers coming down, he bows down to one of them. He says, Lord, let me serve you. And he runs into the tent and he, and, and, and he says to Sarah, make some bread. And then he goes out to his servant, find the calf, prepare it and make a meal. He, he's serving while they wait. Hospitality in that world was huge, still is. And I think it is in most parts of the world. To, to be hospitable to someone is a big, big deal. Some people just, they thrive at serving and thrive at being host. And that was Martha. It's a spiritual gift. And some people have the knack for it just in their own propensity, but it's also a gift from the Lord. Peter said this. He said, cheerfully share your home with those who are in need of a meal, a place to stay. And the Apostle Paul said to the church in Rome, he said, if your gift is serving others, serve them well. Martha did that with open arms. But as we can clearly see within Luke's gospel account, Martha's love for serving kind of became her Achilles heel. Of sorts. She was so consumed by making sure that that everything was just so, that the meal was just right, that the table was being set, that her spirit became anxious. And we hear that worrisome. And you hear a little bit of irritability within her spirit, don't you? And we can hear that in her voice when she said, Jesus, tell my sister to come and help. Right? We all get that way. Goodness gracious, you asked your two daughters to go into the kitchen and clean the kitchen or your two sons to unload the dishwasher, right? You understand that. We've all been there. We were probably all that way when mom and dad asked us to do a chore. (sighs) Right? But when we feel that we're not getting enough help, sometimes we get irritable because we just expect other people to do what we're thinking that they should be doing. What Martha needed in that moment was really a self-induced timeout to really just kind of go take a load off and to kind of sit a spell. Even if that meant that the water had to boil on the stove a little bit longer, even if that meant that the table hadn't quite got set just right, or maybe if the roast stayed in the oven a little bit longer and, and maybe started to, to get a little dry. Martha needed to do what her sister was really, really good at doing, and that was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. Martha was devoted to the Lord. We, we hear that throughout the entirety of the Bible and the gospel accounts. But her sister Mary, she took it up a notch. Mary was hopelessly, hopelessly devoted to Jesus. Anybody have that Olivia Newton-John song stuck in their head now? If you don't, you do now. Thank you very much to yours truly. I almost played it for you. You know, unlike her big sister Martha, Mary wasn't consumed with her. Her priority wasn't preparing the food for her guests. Her priority was like soaking up every single word that fell from Jesus' lips. She gave him all the attention she believed he was due. If we bounce back to the gospel according to John, which I just referenced a little bit earlier ago, John chapter 12, we see in that very same account there where Martha was not only serving that meal, she had probably prepared it too. Lazarus was reclining at the table. And this was shortly after, by the way, Lazarus was raised from the dead. But in this particular story, again, six days before Jesus went to the cross for our behalf, we again see Mary at the feet of Jesus. But this time her devotion is ratcheted up even more. For she goes into somewhere in her home and she grabs an expensive bottle of perfume, a fragrant nard, as it is called, made from pure essence. 
And she anointed Jesus' feet with it, and then she wiped that with her hair. And parenthetically in all this, Judas Iscariot got so upset by all this that he chastised not even, not just her, but in a way, kind of Jesus too, saying in essence that, what is she doing? We we could have taken this and sold this and, and used it for ministry. This is a year's worth of wages. Imagine a bottle of perfume being so expensive that it's worth 50, 60, 70, 80 thousand dollars in our currency. And Judas got upset about this, and of course, Jesus had to rebuke him. But this is the devotion that Mary had to the Lord. She's pouring out her spirit. She's pouring out her soul and her tears and giving him her all, her everything. Quite the offer, wouldn't you say? Mary loved Jesus, and it showed in a hopeless devotion for the Lord. But in a similar way, Martha loved the Lord just the same. It just looked a little bit different. While one was hanging on Jesus' every word, the other needed to hear a different kind of word from the Lord. And we go back to our story. We go back to that word that we just heard moments ago in the gospel. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing to be concerned about. Mary's discovered it. And I'm not going to take it away from her. Jesus' words are somber. They're tender. He wasn't... Getting after her, right? He's just lovingly telling her, Martha, I love what you're doing here. But in this moment, Mary's priorities are a little bit more spot on. Jesus was rebuking her just kind of a little bit, but it was done so compassionately. And it wasn't meant to be a chastisement at all. It's as though that he was suggesting to Martha, to, Martha, come, take, take a load off. Come sit a spell at my feet with your sister. Even if it means the roast gets just a little bit overdone. I think a good question in all this is to ask ourselves, amid all of our busyness in our lives, right, which a lot of it is self-induced, if, you're, if, if, you're, if we're honest with ourselves, How do we find that right balance between being a Mary and being being a Martha? Part of it is what we're doing today. You've taken time out of your lives, and I thank you for that. You've come. The Lord appreciates that. You've come here to gather, to worship, to, to pray, to sing, to praise the Lord, to worship the Lord, to be a community together. Right? The Bible implores us to do these things. I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here. Right? But I think all of us, those who I am preaching to today, right, we all need a little bit more chutzpah, if you know what that word means, right? That Yiddish word. We all need a little bit more chutzpah and say to our friends who are a little bit too busy for worship habitually, and I want you to hear this question because I've I've thought about this a lot. Why should Jesus let you into his father's house? when you won't make time to go into his earthly house. We have a lot of people in our culture, within our country, who would say they're Christians, but they give no time, no devotion to the Lord at all. They're too busy to take an hour out of their week to come and worship the Lord because something else is their priority. Yet one day, they expect to live a mansion, in a mansion that the Lord has prepared for them in heaven but yet they want to give no devotion to the Lord on earth. This is the state of the nation that we're living in today. I'm not the only one who sees it. Every pastor across the nation sees it. Most of us are too afraid to say anything because we don't want to offend anybody. But that's what's going on. That's not you. You're here. But we should want to say to our friends, right, in a loving and encouraging way, 
to encourage them to gather, to draw near the Lord. As the writer of the book of Hebrews said, right? He said, don't neglect meeting together as some people are in the habit of doing. But instead, encourage one another all the more often to gather, especially as the day of the Lord approaches. As Mary did, and even as Martha in her own way, God deserves our devotion. He's given us everything. Shouldn't we give him our everything too, like Mary did? Worship is a part of that equation, but I think there's more to it. It's good for us to sit a spell every day with Jesus at his feet by cracking open his word. To do a little devotion. Maybe we grab a devotional booklet out there like many of you do, which is a beautiful, wonderful thing. We read a devotional, maybe in the morning, maybe right before we go to bed, maybe a little bit of both. Could be in the afternoon. The timing doesn't matter. It's, it's what the heart does. And it doesn't have to be for an hour or even a half an hour. It can just be for a few minutes. To take time to dwell upon God's word, to meditate upon it, and to think upon the Lord through the day. I do it in the morning, but I also do it right before I go to bed. The last thing I do every night before I turn off my cell phone and lay it down on the nightstand is I open up my Bible app and I read a verse for the day and I go to bed with that prayer and that thought on my mind. It helps me sleep a little bit better, but I want to have my last thought for the day be one of the Lord. Added to that, we can sit a spell at the feet of Jesus through prayer. And I know you all pray. I hope you all pray. And in our prayers, it's not just telling God what we think we need or want, but maybe asking the Lord, Lord God, how was your day? Lord, what's on your heart? And then instead of talking more or saying more in our prayers, just letting our minds and our hearts go silent and listening perhaps for a reply. Some people are really good at that. And others like me are challenged with that. But it's a good practice to try to get into. These are three things that we can do on a daily and a weekly basis that help us every single week to sit at the feet of Jesus, to be hopelessly devoted to him. It's good for the soul. It's good for the heart. And it's good for our relationship with the Lord. I think what's really most important to take away for today is that we all really do need to find a balance in our lives and in our Christian walk with the Lord. There are some who just never will make time for the Lord, and there's nothing we can do to really to stop them. But we can pray for them. We can encourage them. And we can choose to be the example by Choosing to make the Lord a priority in our lives. And I can tell you this, the more we do that, the less anxious we tend to feel, the less worrisome we tend to be. I saw that in my grandma Elva. She was very content in the Lord at all point in times in her life. My grandma Hilson loved the Lord, her God, with all of her heart, soul, mind, and strength. She made time for him every week, and I think she made time for him every day. And to me, not only will I remember her for that, but I will remember her for being the hostess with the mostess. She was both a Mary and a Martha. I think Elva was a great example for us all. I, I, I really wish you could have met her. I bet many of you have an Elva in your life. Perhaps one day you'll get to meet my Grandma H. Continue in your devotion to the Lord. And I bet you my bottom dollar that someday Elva will get to meet you in the Lord's house above. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.
Lord God, Heavenly Father, help us find that balance in life where we, amid all of our busyness, that we serve you, that we find devotion to you, where we serve you with our gifts that you've given us and where we also sit at your feet, where we are both a Mary and a Martha, but where we lay aside any anxiousness because we are there at your feet. Help us to find the balance in life to do both. Be the chime that rings into our hearts. Speak to us. Guide us. Help us to love you more and to serve you more. And help us to be an example to those who have maybe forgotten what it means to sit at your feet. Help us be encouragers of our friends and even of ourselves to come take a load off once in a while and to sit at the feet of Jesus and to soak up every word. And it's in his precious name that we pray. Amen.